We are very pleased to have Abishai with us today. Uh, and he is going to tell us his story. And um, I think you all will find it very interesting. So I think um, I will just start uh, to hand over the word to you, Avi. And uh, please, please tell you about yourself and your background. Um, thank you so much, Angela, for inviting me. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who are um, dialed into this call. I'll start by a brief introduction and, and we'll take it from there. Um, I think Ingela will say this too, but um, this is not a presentation. This is not a lecture. This is a discussion. We'll have a discussion between us and we would love to have a conversation with you. So if you have any um, comments or questions, please uh, put them in the chat or raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll try to answer them. So just a little bit about myself, uh, born and raised in Israel um, and moved to um, the US about 20 years ago. Um, I have worked in uh, small um, startup organizations and large companies. My most recent role was um, as the senior engineering director of Google search infrastructure. As the name suggests, this is responsible for the entire infrastructure of Google search. It's a fascinating um, environment to be part of. And one of the reasons um, we thought people will be interested in this conversation, because it's about the challenges of leadership and executions and teams and working in complexity and so many other things that I have um, experienced in my time and that I have led teams successfully through in delivering their um, outcomes. So let me pause here and Ingela, back to you. Yeah, uh, we do each, each of these stories from, reality, stories from reality. They are a little bit different. And today we are going to have a more like a dialogue. Um, so if you have any questions on the way, uh, please raise your hand or write it in the chat. Uh, and we will um, uh, we will try to answer uh, whenever. Mm. Uh, but today is about leadership and uh, how you can build high performing teams. Uh, but but uh, if you think of leadership, uh, Abby, what do you what do you think of, and and uh, what are the most important aspects uh, for you, according to you? Um, if I had to characterize leadership, then I would say it stands on two principles. One is how are you setting the goals, the mission, the vision, um, and, and the things that you want to accomplish in, as an organization? Setting clear and measurable goals, in my opinion, is one of the most important foundations of uh, being a leader in an organization and leading that organization successfully. The second part of um, setting um, clear and measurable goals is communicating them effectively, and we'll touch upon this a little bit later. The other side of the, the this uh, equation is people. Um, in my opinion, it is critically important to bring the people along to align with the goals of the organization. I really like this uh, very, very basic physics analogy, right? Um, if you think about the goals of an organization as an arrow, as a vector in a specific direction. And if you think about the individual aspirations, motivations, excitement, um, motiv in incentives, um, you can think of, and passions, you can think about this as an arrow as well in a specific direction. And if you are able to align the multiple arrows of the individuals in the organization in the same direction as the organization is going, 
then you're getting, again, basic physics, the addition of those vectors, the addition of those forces in the same direction. And if the individuals are not aligned, then you're getting a partial um, uh, element, a partial force, a partial participation of that individual in the overall effort of the organization. And so beyond the physics metaphor, what I'm trying to stress here is setting goals is important. Communicating them is as important. But maybe the most important thing is connect and listen, actively listen to the people that you work with in order to understand what excites them, what inspires them, what they're passionate about, and how you are able to align their goals, their fulfillment with the organization. And so to summarize, organizational goals and alignment of people. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Um, we just got the question from, from the audience and, and they say, uh, we better go much hand in hand with the next uh, question I was gonna ask. Uh, but tell about uh, execution, what is important about it and, and what are some ways to make it better? And the question from the audience was, how do you recognize the high performing team? Mm. Um, taking my principle of two today, um, if I think about execution, I will think about um, two elements, um, ruthless uh, uh, prioritization and relentless execution. What do I mean by that? Um, we often see teams and organizations who have a lot on their plate and they want to accomplish everything. They want to do everything. They are spread too thin and they end up over committing and under delivering. Relentless prioritization is actually taking your organizational goals, the measurable goals, and being able to ruthlessly prioritize them, typically in the order of the impact of each one of the tasks or projects or, or uh, things that you need to do, their impact to the overall goal and draw a priority line where your resources are connect, co completed. Um, and simply don't commit to more than what you can do. Furthermore, um, you need to think about how to balance planning, short and long-term planning with agility, right? User needs change, the market uh, changes, the environment changes. How are you going to respond to those changes in a way that will still support your execution, support your deliverables, support your users? And there is a delicate balance to do there because if you overreact and you respond to every input, then you will be constantly reprioritizing throwing projects around. And if you underdo that, you will be slow to respond. And so a high performing team is a team that has the skills of prioritization, the skills of execution, planning, tracking, um, the skills of actively listening, listening to each other, listening to user needs, listening to changing requirements, changing markets and changing dimensions and responding to all of that um, in a way that drives and maximizes the organizational outcomes. How do you identify uh, high-performing teams? I think um, it will be the, I call them the three R's. Radical listening, where you listen to each other and leaders le listen to um, the people that work with them and for them. Um, Relentless planning and execution. 
Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I lost my track of mind here. Um, the third, the third one, <laughs> listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, was... Right. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and and uh, so radical listening, ruthless planning, and relentless execution. The three R's. So listening, planning, and execution. Um, and the, the three of them are actually the, the combination and the balancing of them. You can't overdo any one of them. And if you're doing any two, um, you will fall into various traps. Great. Um, we got a question. Uh, can you talk about some ways to get a team aligned in a way that you mentioned when they have little to no say in the goal setting process? Uh, such as companies with uh, lots of hierarchy? This is a really, really good question. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I've experienced that um, multiple times because my background is mostly in infrastructure organizations, organizations that are very, very far from the product itself or from the end users. And so one of the things that I um, used to share with my leads and my teams always is I call it connecting the dots. Basically, I want you as an individual in the team to actually know, understand, and then be excited, inspired, motivated by what you're doing right now because you understand how it contributes to um, the end users and the company goals. For example, um, I'll take an example from, uh, from my recent uh, role at Google. Um, one of the top level company goals was how to make Google helpful for users. And the question is, how do I, as an engineer, on the team that is part of the Google search infrastructure, how am I relating to that? The answer is not difficult. Your role is to make the infrastructure resilient, robust, um, reliable, serviceable, um, uh, able to uh, launch new features uh, quickly and efficiently, protect the privacy and security of the users, um, uh, be a very high performance infrastructure, by contributing to each one of those elements, you are in fact contributing even in the smallest way to making Google more helpful for users. Now, there's a different question whether the high level goal in this example, make Google helpful is something that resonates with you. If it does, great. If not, in the most honest way, I'm going to ask you, are you working in the right place? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Going back to the technicality of planning and execution from a tools perspective, one of the things that I'm a very strong advocate of is traceability. So you have the company goals, the organizational goals, and then broken down into the hierarchy and the connecting the dots, you can actually use tools to do that. You should be able to have your agile tasks and projects and so on traceable all the way up um, hierarchically to the entire organization. Mm. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, we have, from yeah, we have a question. Um, and it's uh, Lorena from Madrid. I forgot to say that Avi is uh, in, on Hawaii or in Hawaii. Uh, and now we have uh, Lorena. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yes, my question is regarding when we are talking about a high performance team, we are talking about form leaders that uh, empower the team, they are um, servant leader. How can you deal with some leaders that they don't want to change. The behavior is command and control. And as, as you mentioned, it's very important to scale the, 
the change, the behavior. But sometimes I, I, I feel in that uh, in the company, you, you get a glass ceiling that you can cross. How can you deal with this situation? You asked two questions. One of them is about how do you um, change a, you called it command and control managers to be um, leaders. And the second half of your question was about glass ceiling, which I'd like to understand better. So let me first um, address the first question and, and then I'll hand this back to you. Um, my answer to how do you change managers who um, feel they need to be in command and control, you can think of it as a naive answer. And the naive answer is, I'm going to share my philosophy. I'm going to share my approach to leadership. I'm going to show the benefits, maybe even in a wider and more comprehensive way than I did in the few minutes that we are talking about this. And I'm going to invite my leads and everyone in the organization to join the journey you know as a sub as a sub comment I'll, I'll i'll say here another thing of a language change that that i started doing several years ago um i remember the times where as a leader you were asked required uh, uh, recommended that you create a buy-in with the teams that you're working with with the individuals that you're working with I changed that term and I'm using the term bring along. And there is a there is a language difference and maybe there is a nuance, but to me it's important. Buy-in means that I'm gonna sell something to you. I'm trying to sell something to you. You may or may not buy, right? Bring along is my intention to actually reach out my hand and actually bring you along this journey because I believe that it's exciting, it's motivating, it's inspiring, it's interesting, it's challenging. I'm inviting you to come with me. I'm not trying to sell anything to you. And if you're not interested to, bring, to come along, then that's perfectly fine, right? So those leaders, the beginning of the process is the process of invitation following through a process of coaching and mentoring and supporting and building skills. And at some point, if there is a misalignment, exactly like with the vectors that I described before, then people should go where they feel comfortable to be, right? So it's a little bit of a, a um, strong approach, if you want, but I think that that strong approach yields a very strong results. And being a little bit less humble this morning for you, I have the, the receipts to show, show for that. Uh, but I wanna come back to you and explain to me the question about the glass ceiling. Yes, it's uh, regarding when you trying to escalate this uh, agility model, you, you, you find that some uh, you're working with the managers and then top managers. And if the company is very hierarchical, they don't want to change because they have the silos. And it's, uh, I think that is a ego and a power. Yeah, you know, so it's in the moment that, no, I won't change. I won't uh, work in another way because I'm the master here. Right. That's why I think that you can try to, to get business agility as, as one level. It's difficult to go, to go at the top. Um, I, I think this is a very good question. I'll tell you what I have been always trying to do. I've been trying to create a center of excellence for whatever group or team that I was leading. At the beginning, it was five, 10, 30, 50, and then it became hundreds of people, right? 
it's harder when you have, you are right, it's harder when you have many hierarchies above you and you're not completely autonomous and independent. It is much easier when you are, when you have a higher level of autonomy and independence. What happens when, but you are never by yourself, right? Uh, again, coming back to my most recent role, I was leading an organization, uh, an organization of about 500 people. I was part of an organization of 10,000 people, you know, 20 times this size. But, and, and the entire organization were my customers. All of Google search developers were dependent on the Google search infrastructure, which we provided. And so, Let's take, for example, the relentless prioritization. We could go in one of two ways. We could get everyone's requests into our pipeline and be super nice people and smile to everyone and say, yes, we'll do this for you, for sure. It'll get done by the end of the quarter. Don't worry, trust us. Or, we can do our due diligence, we can do our analysis, we can work with them and with the product people to understand the biggest value and impact that each of those requests have to the business and the cost and impact that that has on our team and whether we are able to do it or not. And then we're going to create a priority list and some things are gonna fall below the line. And then we're going to have a very transparent conversation. Look. It's math, a very simple one. We can't do everything. Here is the priority list as we understand them. Here is our resources as we can share them, right? Those things are below the line. Let's have a conversation. But the conversation is very clear. The sum of our resources is set. And if you wanna bring something which is below the line, you'll need to have a zero sum game, kind of, you'll need to take something above. This is simple program management and it's much more, I was talking before about the principle of radical listening. It is a lot about listening to each other, to your users, to your customers, to the changing requirements and so on and so forth. So coming back to your question, it is much easier to create this discipline in a reasonably autonomous organization. And oftentimes when I see smaller organizations, I still encourage them to take those steps because I believe that even in the smallest organization, your execution and your results will increase. And people will look and say, hmm, this team is doing better than what they have before. What tricks are they using? Can we use them too? Thank you. Great, thank you. We have one more question. Um, I often read that one factor is to keep the team this, um, the same people but how common is that in reality? What is your best advice when it comes to onboarding, offboarding team members? Um, I, I have not heard that uh, a factor is, is in keeping the team the same. I think that one of the challenges um, in a team and in a high performing team is sharing the knowledge and balancing the load. Um, you know, I've seen cases where, especially in tenured organizations, people that have stayed around for a very long time, there are experts. And those experts, it's a gift and a punishment at the same time. The gift is you have someone who's extremely knowledgeable. The punishment is whenever there is a problem in this module, program, whatever you want to call it, we will always go to Avi for the answers. Avi cannot take time off. Avi cannot sleep at night. Avi cannot 
have a weekend, Avi cannot go for vacation. Um, and so when I see situations like that, one is I praise the person for the value that they have. And then I challenge them and invite them to relieve this pressure, relieve this knowledge, share their knowledge with everyone else. And there is so much pleasure in giving knowledge and giving expertise such that the next time someone asks the question, they're going to go to Engela instead of Avi because she knows as much as Avi. Why should we burden Avi while he's on off hours in Hawaii? Mm. Um, with regard to onboarding and offboarding, um, I'll just share two words, kind of knowledge sharing, kind of bringing as much knowledge as you can. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Lars. I think Lars is in Oslo. Will uh, Lars? Mm. Of course, I failed on uh, the most basic of uh, tasks when you are in a video meeting, and that is to turn off the, the mute. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, uh, thank you. I very much like the notion uh, of inviting uh, kind of um, uh, colleagues, uh, bosses, uh, and staff along in kind of journeys they want them to go instead of kind of overselling it. I think we you know, the, the, uh, the agile people of the world have a tendency of ending up overselling and, you know, pushing too hard. Having that in mind, um, it would be interesting if you could share an experience or two experiences, you know, one uh, from the most successful transformational uh, system change you've been involved in and the other one, uh, you know, where you failed, a system change that has failed. And what, what do you think it's the most critical differences between the two, both in terms of approaches uh, and kind of the reflection you've, uh, you've made uh, thereafter? Uh, you know, what works, what doesn't work? Right. Um, let me start with the failure. Um, if I had to summarize the failure um, and, and kind of bottom line, what were the reasons for uh, for the failure was um, lack of listening. I didn't listen to my colleagues. I didn't listen to the product people. Um, I didn't listen to the user. Um, I was overconfident with the technology. I did not bring sufficient perspectives into the creation of the product. And, and I'm, I'm deliberately using this reserved word uh, perspectives because it's coming from the complexity model of Kanevin, um, for those who are familiar. Um, I'm a strong advocate. I'm using Kanevin in my teams, and I'm bringing this to my teams because I think it's a tremendous tool. Uh, when when Ingela and I were talking about this, I, I think I used the term, um, I feel like Kanevin is a hammer for me and everything looks like a nail. Um, and so bringing multiple perspectives or not bringing multiple perspective can be the material difference between success and failure. Um, in addition to that, I, I think that, that um, as I mentioned, um, the three R's kind of radical listening, which I mentioned, ruthless planning, um, which is the balance between agility and commitment, which you need to hold, and relentless execution, kind of monitor what you're doing, um, have the proper metrics and measurables to that. When you're holding and balancing those um, three elements, um, in my opinion and my experience, this is a recipe for success. Thank you. You're welcome, Thank you. Lars. Thank you for the question. The big question you pulled down to a quite concrete answer. So that's quite well done. Thank you. Great. Uh, but when we talk about complexity, and, and as you mentioned, we talked about that you used uh, Kanevin, but can, um, can you a little bit 
um, describe more in detail how you work with the tool? Uh, um, I need to be careful here because if I start to talk about Caneva and this meeting is going to last for a couple of four hours. Um, um, it is a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Um, so the challenge I have right now is this is a complex environment and I need to come up with a reasonable answer in a short amount of time. So what experiment should I try? Uh, <laughs> um, the complex uh, state within the Kinevin uh, framework is the one that I believe many of us um, live and execute in, in, in a, on a regular basis. Um, you know, the simple and complex spaces are, as the name suggests, they are simple, the complex spaces, you have the expert. This is not something that typically as a leader, you need to pay a lot of attention to. You have your program managers, you have your technical leads. It, it can be offloaded. The, the complex space is the one that is most challenging because it lives in the unpredictable side of the universe, the unpredictable and the nonlinear side of the universe, right? You can't tell what is going to happen when you're going to do something. And so your entire state of mind is about hypotheses and experiments and perspectives and, and, and polarities, right? Um, I'm not gonna give the entire lecture, uh, which mm -hmm. takes many, many hours about Kineva. And if you don't know, then go and look for the resources. Maybe we'll post them online somewhere after the meeting. Yeah, what is interesting, yeah. what is, what is interesting about um, bringing along the leadership team into the principles of Kinevin, and especially into the complex space, but into the principles of Kinevin, is you create a common language. And I've experienced that several times. So you ask yourself, so Avi, what is a common language? A common language is when you have a completely open conversation around the table, whether it's on Zoom or in a physical room, and you constantly hear the words, um, what experiments can we come up with? What is a different perspective to be here? Um, what are we trying to accomplish? That's a, that's a translation of what experiment are we going to run? The other part of this is if you have that state of mind of complex space with hypotheses and experiments, then the outcome of an experiment is the outcome of the experiment. Sorry for the tautology. There is one of two outcomes. You either confirm the hypothesis or you did not confirm the hypothesis. Either way, you have a positive and constructive learning from that experiment. It will either amplify what you're doing or you're gonna try something else. Notice that in the last 30 seconds, I did not use the word fail anywhere. And so whether you're a junior engineer or a team lead, what you're doing when you have the common language and, and structures of working in complexity, then you're not afraid of failure. You're not afraid of collaborating. You're not afraid of trying things out because you know that what you try can actually support a hypothesis that you're setting. And then building on that, you may be able to solve that really, really complex problem that you're trying to solve. And I'll say the other thing is, in lack of that, your chances of solving the most complex, in proper English, not in the Kinevin model, um, problems is going to diminish if you don't have that state of mind. Yeah, great. Thank you. We have a really long question from Adrian here. Would Adrian like to place the question himself or? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so you, you have a a scenario where you have a company who, or yeah, 
many companies actually uh, who have a dilemma when they scale up. The problem is uh, they have a way of working, which is very good in the in the startup phase uh, because this way of working brings a company to the scaling up phase. But then uh, you suddenly have a lot of new employees, you have a lot of teams, you might have distributed around uh, along a lot of time zones and so on. But the management team is the same. How can you, what's the best strategy to convince uh, the, the management that uh, it's, it might be a good idea to change the, the way of working, the uh, approach to, uh, to even some, to, to some management practices in, in this kind of situation where you're actually transforming from a startup to a medium company, let's say. I'm smiling because this is such a common question and this is such a difficult question. Um, and it's a complex question, complex as in C for not copyright, but C for Kinevin. Um, uh, I shared with Ngela that, that I had the privilege of working with Keith Johnson, who wrote one of the early books about uh, working in complexity. Um, and he shared with me, and I think he shared the public as well, is every situation where you have people involved is by definition a complex space. Because as human beings, we're unpredictable. By the way, this is a really, really good observation. And for everyone on this call who are, are living and breathing this space, realizing that the minute we are part of a process, it makes it complex, you change your way of thinking about it. But Adrian, I'm gonna come back to your question. Um, someone shared with me, with me quite a few years ago um, they call it the rule of three or the rule of three X. An organization changes and needs to change its structure, its behavior, its processes, its execution every time it grows by three X from five to 15 to 50 to 150 to 500. Every time you go to one of those steps, the entire organization needs to change. Now, when we go from five to 15, we still know everyone and maybe we need to stretch ourselves a little bit, but, but it's fine, we, we can make it work. And when you're going from 15 to 20 and 25 and 30, it's still okay, um, you can make it work. Um, you start to burst at the seams when you're at 50. You're bound to almost completely lose control when you're getting to 60, 70 or 100. If you're not, if you have not already started to to deal with these changes of of, of uh, structure and process and leadership, as you did, not to mention that when you're going from 100 to 500 along the way, um, you'll need to completely change. Um, maybe, maybe again, it's naivete, right? If you are listening well enough, if you are attentive, if you have someone who would whisper in your ear, hey, you should pay attention because something is developing here, then you'll pay attention and you'll adjust and, and you learn the new skills and you will adapt the organization. And for example, you will start to think about planning processes and execution and the frameworks that's related to them. And if not, you're gonna fail. And if you're not gonna fail from 20 to 30 to 50, you may fail at 70, you may fail at 100, you may fail when you're 80 people and, and you promise the delivery to your customers and you are late by three months, by six months, by nine months. And then someone at the higher level, at the chairman of the board or are going to pay attention and say, uh, <clears throat> um, what's happening with your execution here? You promised this six months ago, it's not already here, what's going on? That will be slightly late to react, but not completely. So I don't know if it answers the question. I think that if I'm trying to bottom line is 
you have no choice but to adapt and change the organization and introduce the active listening and the planning and the execution. And if you know, if you won't, then at some point in the growth process of the organization, you will find one or more failures. Uh, yes, it partially uh, asked, uh, answered my question, but I, I have a, re a small related question. If you would have to introduce this kind of uh, new uh, way of workings, would you start from the bottom upward, from the top to bottom? Uh, will you try to uh, uh, introduce this to, uh, to to some departments or some team, or try to, to do it to the entire organization uh, from the from the beginning? Um, just as a clarification, the entire organization, an entire company, or you're talking about entire organization, yeah. engineering organization? No, no, the the entire company. I mean, even sales, even because it, in my mind, it's kind of pointless. Like the, the tech department is, is agile, where all the other stakeholders are not agile. Um, um, in my humble opinion, the jury is still out on that. I, I. I I won't say that I disagree with you, but I'm not going to take this last statement that you said as I I'm going to lead for that. I, I I have a much stronger opinion on building a a an engineering organization that delivers well. If you argue against me and say that an engineering organization without a sales marketing organization that brings the perspective of the users and without a um, execution engine of finance and operations that um, brings the execution probably, I will probably um, tend to agree with you. Um, I think it is more critical to the success of a product organization that its engineering is, is ahead in terms of its practices. Hmm? Um, but I think I hooked onto something and I forgot your question. No, the question was, would you start from, for example, from tech and from try the to top or from the bottom? Yeah, and, and yeah, go to product and go to other parts of the organization or start from the bottom and say, okay, this is uh, kind of uh, what we're trying to achieve and try to implement it everywhere at once. So I would start from the top of the product organization meaning mm -hmm. product and engineering, whether they're together or not. But I would start from the top. I would expect the top leaders of this or those organization, product and engineering, to, um, to lead that transformation of, hey, we got to the point where we need to do things differently. And mm -hmm. this is why, right? And this goes back to my point of what is our goal? Our goal is to deliver great product. Our goal is to have people that are um, aligned with the organization. We have, we have arrived to a size and complexity of our org that we can't do this like we did this before. Therefore, we're introducing this change. And this is what we expect in a measurable way. You know, the process change becomes one of the measurable goals of the organization. And the success of the organization is, is based on introducing this change into the organization. And the time spent on process, on tools and disciplines and so on, is not something that you do in your spare time. It's part of what you need to invest in. Mm -hmm. Remember, I talked about resources and costs and all of that. That's something that we need to accomplish. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. Jonas? Yeah, we have a... Hi there, Avi. Uh, I would like to ask about team size. What is your, what would you say is the ideal number of team members on a team and how is it on, on Google? Oh, I think that you hit on the holy grail question. <laughs> <laughs> If we actually had the, the answer for that, I think that all of us would be uh, very happy. Um, it depends. It depends. Um, I think that in small organizations, and let's call small, um, let's say less than 50, probably less than 30, um, 
there is great value to the flatness of the organization. You enable communication between individuals. Um, you almost, by definition, enable the multiple perspectives that are required into solving those complex environments that we are in um, naturally, because people are close to each other and talking and so on and so forth. Um, when you grow above that, then it becomes impossible. You can't bring 30 people and not even 15 people into a room to bring all the perspectives. You do this once a quarter to do the, your safe planning and so on. But beyond that, it's very, very expensive and, and time consuming and energy consuming and, 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 and so on. And so now you're starting to build sub teams. And I think that, that you know, the agile methodologies that were created decades ago teach us how to do that. You need to do this in a scalable way. So let's say that 30 was an extreme stretch of the model. And let's say that the team of six to eight people is, is the best small team that can actually talk with each other effectively and small and so on. Then at some point, long before you get to a team of 30 with a single manager, you probably created a, a, you know, a couple, two, three, four teams of six, eight, 10 people in them. And I use another cliche that is very, very well known and it's related to the goals that I, I said. It's very important for an organization to have goals, right? And measurable goals. You want to look at organization like a fractal, right? You want to break them down where every sub-organization also has clear and measurable goals, et cetera, exactly like fractals. When you look at every piece of that, it looks exactly like the others. So what is the magical number? It's anywhere between three and four and six and eight. 10 and 12 is becoming too large. Um, and it depends on the complexity of the problem and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's a very wide range, but the answer is it depends somewhere in this range. Sure. Yep. Thanks. Thank sure. uh, we have some more questions there and they are a little bit uh, related, but um, how to increase the self-confidence of a high performing team uh, how do you make them realize that they are amazing as teams? And also, I have a little question connected to that, but how do you work with the individuals in the team to make them shine, to find that spark that ignites them to do their best? I'll start with the second question, because I think that that one is incredibly important. Um, Radical listening. Radical listening. Listening because you're curious. Listening because you care. Uh, because you care first and foremost about the person. I'll, I'll give a, a side story here. I've had numerous examples of engineers in my teams who were evaluated as low performers. And time and again, when I employed radical listening, caring, compassion, I realized that these are talented individuals that are in the wrong place. And time and again, when we identified their passions, their motivations, their inspirations, their uh, excitement and put them in a place that were right for them, they thrived and they were successful. Mm -hmm. right. um, so the first part of that is truly spend time and listen to people. And I have another story to share with your permission. I had a relatively new employee, um, several months, new college graduate, and 
met with them and uh, they were used to our uh, project conversation as in what's the status and what you're doing. And I started with the question of, uh, are you happy? And the person looked at me in a confused look and saying, why are you asking me this question? And none of my managers ever asked me anything like that. And I said, listen, it's very simple. If you are happy and fulfilled and excited and inspired and committed and motivated and passionate about what you do, you're going to be at your peak performance. And in the most selfish way, I care deeply about you as a person. Yes, I do. But even if I didn't, even if I was a robot manager, I want and need you to be at your peak performance. And what is another way of making you at your peak performance other than making sure that you're in your happy place and the place of fulfillment? So that's related to that. Inga, Inga, uh, remind me what was the first question. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much and I forgot. <laughs> no, the first uh, one was, uh, if you have a high performing team and they're doing amazing, but how can you increase their uh, confidence? Um, uh, how do you make them realize that they are an amazing team? Um, Usually those are not the difficult problems because mm -hmm. amazing individuals and amazing teams usually get public recognitions and celebrations from all around. Um, that, that I, I have never seen a challenge of, of uh, uh, a, a high performing team not knowing that they are. The bigger challenge is how do you let a team that is that their performance is mediocre, um, not failing, but simply not good enough? How do you wake up such a team? I think that's the biggest challenge, mm. the bigger challenge. Mm. Do you want me to answer that question? Yes, please. Um, hammer and nails, I'll use another one of my hammers, radical listening. Have a open heart-to-heart -heart conversation with the team that starts with the question, how do you think we're doing? Listen. And as you're listening, listening to the, listen to the language and look for proof, look for data. At least on the engineering side, we are data-driven. And seek the data that supports whatever premise is being given. Now, there, there are one of multiple options here. One is you are under the impression that the team is underperforming. But maybe you don't have all the perspectives. Maybe you're not aware of the number of um, on-call tickets that are happening. Maybe you're not aware of the fact that three out of the eight people on the team are not only constantly on call, but they are those amazing experts that everybody call on to constantly, whether they're on call or not. And so their projects constantly suffer because they need to solve the world's problem all the time. And so what perspectives are you missing? What data do you not have the, the, uh, the visibility to? And vice versa, kind of what information do you have? What data are you building with? With radical listening, when there is trust and confidence in this conversation, sharing perspectives 
will unearth the problems, the challenges, the multiple perspectives, and will lead to, okay, so this is what we're seeing, and this is different than the goals that we want to accomplish. What are some ways that we need to change? What are some experiments that we want to run? How will we evaluate the results of those experiments? What hypotheses do we want to set? Mm. Nothing is simple, especially when, when people are, are involved. Mm. Emily, how did you find your own personal leader style? Uh, how did you? Um, through trial and error, lots mm. of error, lots mm -hmm. of failure. Mm -hmm. Lots of, um, I think I know what I'm doing only to realize that I'm driving to a wall at 100 kilometers an hour and hitting mm -hmm. that wall. Mm -hmm. um, great leaders and mentors. I remember um, two that that uh, that stick with me for a while, actually several. Um, one is a is a really interesting experience. I'm not gonna obviously name names, um, but I'll even obfuscate it further. I will only say that I actually left that manager. I left my role and 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 looked for a different role and found a different role to leave that manager only to realize years later that he was one of the strongest supporters and role models and, and great advice that he gave me. It was just tough love, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was just tough love. And the other one, which I think shaped a lot of what um, I did, uh, the following is a phrase that, that he coined, at least for me. He said, Avi, my job is to work myself out of the job. Mm -hmm. And think about that phrase. As a leader, my job is to work myself out of a job. Think how many layers are inside that. Mm -hmm. It's collaboration, it's leadership, it's succession planning. Um, it is people development, right? I'm successful when I can go away for months at a time or just leave and the organization will be successful. It means that I set the organization in the right direction. It, it has clear processes, it has clear goals, it has leaders in place that can fill in the role. And so what can I do? It's never about job security, not at that level, not at that point. Mm -hmm. You can do one of two really, really important things. One is if you actually work yourself out of, the, out of a job, you can take a significantly larger view and a bigger perspective of what's possible. This is the point of innovation. We've accomplished this. Everybody are busy and successful in um, reaching our current goals. What else can we do, mm. right, as an organization? And two, for me, I've reached this peak. What is, what is next for me? Mm. I am accomplished, I did this. What is next for me? I'm now free to explore whatever is good for me. So both of those so options are so appealing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, especially the one who kind of uh, make everything happen so you don't need myself. I find that a great inspiration, but you don't run into these kind of managers so often. Uh, the, the clock is yeah the clock is ticking it's been wonderful to have you here Avi and I could stay on longer uh, but the last question you now work as a coach uh, full-time could you tell us a little bit uh, about that uh, uh, the, your new role um, I gladly will thank you um... I realized that I can do what I'm doing here in this last hour. Um, and I can also scale myself. Being an infrastructure person, being someone who's worked in infrastructure and thinking about 
scalability, reliability, performance, et cetera, et cetera, all of those things for almost my entire professional career, um, I can scale myself, right? In my previous roles, I was the leader of an organization that I described to you um, who took the responsibility to lead that organization, to set the goals, to build the organization, to accomplish the goals, to develop the individuals. But I can scale myself now by actually working with such individuals. I, in the most humble way, I no longer feel the need to be that VP, that senior director of engineering, that whatever it is, I love mentoring, coaching, supporting others. And the scalability comes from the fact that I can work with this leader and their team and whisper in their ears, mentor, coach, support. And then the next hour I can work with that other team. And so like a multiprocessor, um, hyper-threaded, um, I can push multiple teams in the right direction. And so my impact is scaled. And of all the things that I'm passionate about, you know, the planning, the execution, the one that I'm most passionate about is developing people and seeing them succeed. And so that is what I'm focused on today. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for attending, uh, joining us today. Um, I see a lot of good um, feedback in the chat. Uh, so I think we need to round up because it's five past 10, but uh, lovely having you here. And thank you so much all for attending. Uh, we will shortly, we have a new uh, topic. Uh, for um, after Easter, we will have a new uh, story from reality. So please join um, if you have the time. Uh, but all, thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you so much. Bye.